Welcome to Mike Morrison Ministries, Church at the Barn, Saturday Night Life. I've had opportunity this week to have my faith tested in uh, I've had my faith tested before and I've passed higher on the test than I did this time. And so I'm gonna be better prepared the next time I come across something like this, whatever it is that hit me. Um, I made it because and I knew what to do and I and I did I did what needed to be done, but I wanted <clears throat> look at some things tonight because every once in a while church we wind up in a fight in the in the quickest way from from when you hit the fight till you come out the other side in victory the fast track is to not um, quit swinging you got to keep swinging when you don't feel like it. And uh, what we do, church, when we fight the good fight of faith is confess and believe in our heart and say with our mouth what God gave us in this word. And when we do that, the word that's already anointed it's the anointed word of God, but it's mixed with our faith and activated <clears throat> into this planet legally because God left us here in charge of this place with his word to run it with. And so when we come under uh, a personal attack, then instead of fighting um, well, normally the attacks that we come under aren't so personal. At least for me, they haven't been in years. It's been a long time since I've been hit with this kind of sickness, this hard, um, and uh, it, it, it surprised me. I had assumed evidently that I had developed in that area to where there was a hedge of protection out there that divine healing is what it's called. And when, when you're walking in divine health, then you don't, so what the reason is there for divine healing, the sickness can't get past that protection, that blood wall, and you're not getting sick. You're just walking in divine health. How many of you know there's a difference between divine health and divine healing. But for some reason that thing ever gets through and the sickness hits, then you need to know how, then you need to know how to fight. And then and you need to know how to fight anyway because you and I need to be fighting for everybody else all of the time. But how many of you know it's easier to fight for somebody else where healing is concerned because it's a lot easier to believe somebody else is going to get well when they're the one that's sick because I'm not feeling what they're feeling. I can, uh, I can go there with a certain amount of sympathy and understanding but in the truth, I'm not going to help them any with sympathy and understanding. It's compassion that's going to get the help to them. And in compassion, I don't necessarily have to feel what they're feeling. I need to do something about what they're feeling. Compassion says, I just wish there's something to, that I could do, and there is, and I'm going to do it. I'm doing it now in the name of Jesus. And you hold them up in prayer. Amen. And... Uh, and thank God for people that, that hold other people up in prayer. It speeds the healing process tremendously. But uh, um, what I wanted to 
look at tonight was some things, but it's real simple things, that when you, if you get in a position where you don't feel like saying anything, which is what happened to me, I did not feel like opening up my mouth. I felt like being very, very quiet. Well, why? Because the enemy knew that in order to keep me sick, he had to keep me quiet. In order, if the, if the enemy could have done what he wanted to do to me or anybody else that's been sick in the last couple of years, it's kill you. The thief cometh but to kill, steal, and destroy. And he would like to kill everybody. And so you hear this stupid theology about how the devil's after this guy to get him on his side and he's after this guy and he made a deal with this guitar player so he'd sell his soul to the devil and all of that stuff. The devil didn't make any deals. If he hates people, he don't care if you're going to hell or you're going to heaven or where you're going as long as you get and you get now. He would like you dead this second. He's a killer. There's not a good thing in him. And he disguises himself all kind of ways and passes himself off. And people listen to their feelings and they listen to their intellect and they listen to these stupid books you can buy in the Christian bookstores that tell you all kind of stupid things that people have made up in their head that are not Bible, they're not true, and they make, they, 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 Give the enemy a place to hide. And from this pulpit, I don't ever want to give that clown any place to hide. Make no mistake, if you're sick, the devil's behind it. Amen. If you're having financial trouble, the devil's behind it. If you're, having, if you're having social relationships, difficulties with other people, the devil's behind it. And he's going to blame God the first chance he gets, but it's not God. It's never God. God's on your side. God's on Putin's side, for crying out loud. He's a human being. Every single world leader in this world is a human being. And we don't wrestle with flesh and blood. Our job, church, is not to fight human beings. Our job is to get a hold of these devils, get them under our feet, and keep them under our feet, and don't give them any wiggle room whatsoever. And you do that with words. And when you don't feel like saying something, you need to find something that puts some fight in you. And that's what God showed me the other day when I was sitting there sucking my thumb. You gotta fight. You gotta fight. Yeah. And the more you know about this, the more important it is that you do fight. And the more important it is that you fight when you don't feel like it. So if you found Colossians, I wanna read uh, verse, uh, one Colossians chapter one. And uh, there's a prayer here that I'm, I'm going to read to begin with. Colossians 1, verse 9. Now, when you find these prayers in the New Testament, you want to make them yours, but they're anointed. <laughs> Everything in the Bible is anointed. So an anointed prayer is a handy thing to have. Can you mute that if I have to do that again? Hold on. If, if I say excuse me, hit that mute. <laughs> you can't do it. I'll just get. I'll just rip it off. Um, praise God. Uh, for a blood covenant that God's given us, that puts us in a place of power. And these prayers, these anointed prayers, if you reiterate them, they're not, it's not vain repetition if you take a prayer out of the Bible 
and you re-pray it, and you believe in your heart and say with your mouth what's inside that prayer, you're activating an anointed prayer. It's not vain repetition, it's brilliant. It's a God-given secret weapon. So look at this one right here for Colossians chapter 1, verse 9. For this cause, we also, since the day we've heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to desire that. So right here starts with he didn't cease praying. He prayed this for him all the time. Never stop praying this. So you and I probably shouldn't stop praying it either. That you be filled with all the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding that you might walk worthy of the Lord unto all pleasing, being fruitful in every good work and increasing in the knowledge of God. After you know it all, increase in it. Wow. Strengthen with all might according to his glorious power unto all patience and long-suffering with joyfulness, giving thanks unto the Father, which has already made us able to be partakers of the inheritance of the saints in light. Say, thank you, Father. You've given me an inheritance, and I can partake of it right now. And you're giving me knowledge of how to do that. And, and you've, you've, you've given it to me so I can use it on behalf of people and use it to put the devil and his curse under my feet. Thank you, Lord. So with that context in Colossians 1, let's skip down here to uh, verse 20. Uh, verse 19. For it pleased the Father that in him should dwell all fullness. That in him should all fullness dwell. And having made peace through the blood of his cross, by him to reconcile all things to, unto himself, by him I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven, and you that were sometimes alienated and enemies in your mind by wicked works, yet now hath he reconciled in the body of his flesh through death to present you holy and unblameable and unreprovable in his sight. That's God's will for you. If you continue in the faith grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of the gospel. Hope should have been translated sometimes, you, or at least you should translate it yourself sometimes, earnest, intense expectation. Otherwise, you get this English idea of the word hope, and it's like, I sure hope so. Are, 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 uh, are you going to get a raise next, year, next week? I sure hope so. That's not Bible hope. That's natural wishing, fingers crossed, silliness. And when you read the word hope in the Bible, that is never what it's talking about. So you should translate it in earnest, intense expectation. You find out in Hebrews chapter 11 that faith is the substance of things hoped for and the evidence of things not seen. So hope is in, in your imagination. You can see the promise of God. You can see it. God promised it. It's mine. I can see it. That's hope. Most people think that's what faith is, but that's not what faith is. Hope can see it, and faith is a creative force that grabs what hopes, that hope picture and turns it into something real. In this, it, makes, it takes not real. It's real and visible. 
but it takes, faith takes it from invisible to visible. It takes that hope picture and makes it appear in this realm we live in. That's what faith is. And that's what the Bible said, the just shall live by faith. This is how you and I are supposed to live at all times. So what the enemy of God has got to do is water this down. He's got to get the body of Christ to look at this through a filter where there's not near so much power in it. Take all the, all the promises of God. If you do this, this will happen like this. The devil's got to blur that up, man. You get to finding out what God said and believing it, the devil is out of business. He can't stop the word of God. Never could. He couldn't stop the word from getting in the earth or Jesus would have never got here if he could have stopped it, but he couldn't. The Bible said that he known he never would have crucified the Lord of glory. So you can tell right now he's not the hot rod he's telling everybody is. He don't know everything. There's some things if he'd have known, he'd have done a whole lot different. But he does know how to get a human being's mind off of what God said over onto some junk he's thought of. Because there's no truth in him. If the devil's got his toe in the religious idea, there's no God left in it. Just enough to suck people in there, but it, there's no power in it. God's power is in the pure truth of the word without man adding to it or subtracting from it or bending it one tiny little bit. God's promises work exactly the way God said, put them down. And they don't work any other way. So when people tell you there's something you have to do, but you can't find that in the Bible, don't get caught up in that. The just shall live by faith is what Jesus said in the Bible. Faith in what? In the promises of God. So right here we have this promise. It's, um, it's said that um, um, God's already made all this work for the saints in light. All we have to do is, verse 23, continue in the faith. Grounded and settled and not be moved away from the earnest expectation of the good news. The good news is what? Look down to verse 27. God, to whom God would make known what is the riches of the glory of this mystery among the Gentiles, which is. Here's the mystery right here. Christ in you, the hope of glory. Christ is Greek, should be translated the anointed one, and the anointing the anointed one is anointed with. Jesus said, it's not me, it's the spirit in me doing everything you see done. And when I go, I'm sending the spirit that's been in me, and he'll be in you, and the things that I do, you'll do, because the one that's been doing it is in me, it's going to be in you, and he's going to be doing it through you just like he was doing it through me. That's the gospel. That's what the devil doesn't want preached. He wants people to go to church, and he wants them to learn about how many missionary journeys Paul took, and he wants them to talk about love, and he wants them to talk about fruit, and he particularly wants them to talk about the gifts and he wants us to do a lot, of, a lot of things. He'll help you do things in church. But you get over here around this, he's going to shut that preacher down if he can. 
If he can't shut that preacher down, he's going to keep people from coming there and listening to that because if people listen to that and believe that, he's out of business. He can't stop this. It's already done. People found out, find out about it and they make it the number one priority in their life. He's done. It happened to him before. On the day of Pentecost, he's licking his wounds from one righteous man that come alive in a pit of hell and just thump, thumped him and led him in a triumph through the heavenly. One man defeated him and everything he's got took away every bit of authority he had, said, now I got the keys. Hallelujah. And the devil's laying there 40 days later, and they, they said, Holy Ghost, that came into the pit of hell, come in that upper room. And he could hear it. Everybody could. It sounded like a mighty rushing wind. And it got in that upper room <coughs> and circled around in there, got on top of 120 people and went inside, went inside every one of them. Filled every one of them up with the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The same power that Jesus walked in for three and a half years. The same one Jesus said, when I go, he's coming to be in you. And the things I did, you'll do. Because he was doing them then and he'll be doing them now. And he got in them in that upper room. And that's the gospel. And it's never changed. That's what should be being preached from every pulpit all day, every day. That's the most important thing in the Bible. You get that much and you keep that on your tongue, you keep that in your heart, there's so much other stuff you'll never have to worry about it because it can't touch you with a 10-foot pole. This is what God showed me that I needed to be doing when I was sitting there sucking my thumb in that chair. That power that was inside, that was in the upper room that raised Jesus from the dead was on the inside of me sitting there in that chair and I'm sitting there like a dork. Just saying, just being honest. Why? Because I didn't feel like it. Man, this isn't based on how you feel. This is based on what God said. And this will work whether you feel like it or not. What you feel like has absolutely nothing to do with it. That's why I get so tired of hearing Christians talking about what they feel all the time. I don't care what you're feeling. It's great. You're feeling good, good. You're feeling sad, so what? It, it isn't based on what you're feeling. You get your mouth in gear and how you feel is going to start changing. Your emotions were not given to you by God to, to, to lead and you follow. They're given to you by God. You do what he said and your emotions will get in there and help you do it. You, get, you start letting those things run your life and you'll sit there sucking your thumb when you ought to be talking. You'll be silent when you ought to be praising God at the top of your lungs. I'm going to tell you something about this aftermath of this thing that I'm, I'm getting free of the rest of it even as we speak. But when we got here and practiced tonight, I coughed my way through pretty near every song we practiced. But when the anointing in the room <laughs> showed up, I never coughed one time, I don't think, in the um, music. What's the difference? When you, <clears throat> you get over there doing what God told you to do, then God's going to start doing some things only he can do anyway. People spend so much time trying to get God to do what he said he's going to do. Quit worrying about God's part of it. Start doing yours. He's good at his part. 
And the reason it looks like God isn't doing anything is because the person that he's trying to help isn't doing anything to activate it. You gotta activate it. And it, it almost always comes down to this. You gotta do something when you don't feel like it. Your emotions aren't helping, your want to isn't helping. You, you got nothing but what God said and your willingness to obey it. And just do it because God said to do it. And I would also add this. God said to do it. You should expect something good to come from it when you do. An expectation of good happening and an obedience to do what he said to do. And you know what? If you find something in the New Testament that God said don't do it, don't do that. See, if he said don't, don't. But it's not, this isn't based on your ability to do and not do directions. This is based on who God is and who you're full of. And he's already given you everything. But it's got to be activated. It's voice activated. The blessing of God is voice activated. And you have the blessing. God gave it to you and you would receive Jesus as Lord of your life. You're full of the blessing. Now, to activate it, you, you voice it. It's how you got saved. If you didn't voice activate that blessing, you're not born again. Why do you think the Bible said, if you believe in your heart and say with your mouth, you'll be saved? Because it's voice activated. And people say, well, my heart's right in my heart. I've asked God, it isn't what you ask God. It's what he already gave you. And there's one simple, one simple trigger that God gave you to activate the new birth and anything else in this book. They're all activated the same way. They're all given the same way. They're all in promise form. You find the promise and you believe the promise, and then you say it. I was preaching this one time years ago, and somebody come up and uh, said, what about a mute that can't say anything? And, and uh, I thought, of, I was in the process of thinking about it, and God said, he wouldn't be mute when he, when, he, when he said what I told him to say. He'd have voice to say it. To be the quickest way for a mute to get a miracle you've ever seen. Because God set it up to be voice activated. And if you don't have a voice, he'll give you one to activate it with. Because you have a right to be here and speak. The human being was given the right by God to speak. To believe in your heart and say with your mouth and God will defend what you believe and say. And if you want to pick the devil and pick hell and believe that and say that, God will defend your right to do that. He doesn't want you to. He said, don't do that. Choose life. But you have a right. You have been given by God the right to choose. Religion would like God to do all the choosing for them, except when they want to get in the way and do it theirself. It doesn't work that way. God's given us a choice. Somebody counted the choices that a human being goes through throughout the course of a 24-hour day? Thousands. 
thousands of choices you make every day. When you're going to sit, when you're going to stand, when you're going to say something, when you're going to work, when you're going to not, when you're going to sleep, when you... Just, just, it looks pretty involuntary, some of that stuff, but it's not. It's a choice every time. Well, our life is just choice, 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 choice. And we live like that. And then God has given us the God-given power to make choices that are the difference between life and death the blessing and the curse. And we can filter every thought that comes through our head and choose a life thought instead of death. We can, we can choose good instead of bad. We can choose a blessing instead of the curse. Choice after choice after choice after choice. The only thing you can mess, the only way you can mess this up is to quit ch choosing and go over on autopilot somewhere and just let your head run off and do whatever it wants. The problem with that is God's enemy does have access to your thought life. And he puts some screwy thoughts in our heads. How many of you ever thought that you knew what that woman was thinking? Probably better the other way. How many wives have ever thought, I know what that guy is thinking? No, you don't. I got Bible on it. You might think you're that smart. You might think you're sovereign, but you're not. You might think you can read his mind, but you can't. And he may have done that so many times, you think that's the way he's going to do it this time. It doesn't mean it's true. God won't do that for you. You have no right to read another human's mind. I don't care if you're married to him or not. God's not giving you that right. It's not yours. If you want to know what he's thinking, you're going to have to ask him. And you're going to have to shut up long enough to listen to what he says. And you're going to have to sort through the truth he's telling you and the other crap and find out, you know, what he really meant. And how many of you know that takes time? <sighs> so then he needs to shut up and listen while the other, while the wife talks. And he actually listens to what she says and sorts through her crap. It's like, Wow. She said that five times. Now, there's got to be more to it than that, right? This works best, you know, if you're having trouble, if you've got an egg timer or something where you, you, the person that likes to... They, can, they have to shut up when the time goes... Bzz, that means zip it. And the other person that never says anything... This starts when you say something, and we're going to sit here till you do. <laughs> this doesn't work really well right off the bat, but over time, when people can begin to communicate, actually, truly, listen to what the other person's saying instead of back to my point, thinking you can read their mind because you can't. And think, this is, a, there, there's a reason why marriage um, failure in the church is so high. When God has given us a way for it to be 100% right all the time, over 50% of the Christian marriages wind up in divorce. Why? People won't follow this. It's like, that is way too hard, man. Besides that, it's an old book written by old authors and they don't understand our modern times. And they were all male chauvinists anyway. They don't understand how good a woman is at reading a man's mind.
That alone ought to tell you how far tra off track you are. If you've ever thought that you could read another person's mind, you've spent too much time pumping up your intellect with education and not near enough time reading the Bible. This is truth. It'll make you free. The education system can screw you up to where you'll never get back. The truth is you can't read his mind. And he can't read yours, and God doesn't want either one of you doing that anyway. That's demonic. That's how the devil operates. Ouija boards and seances and getting people's heads. and It's just not the way God does things. God said you communicate. You say out loud the picture on the inside of you and you paint it for that other person clear and then shut up and let them paint the picture for you. We don't see in words, we see in pictures. So you take turns painting a picture and you'll know that other person when they get done with their picture, you can see them. It's what communication is for. It's key to marriage. You couldn't have to turn off some devices because it takes time. And the devil knows that, so he's got all this junk to keep people from communicating. And if you ever stop communicating, then he'll run in there, put spurs on, couple of devils that peck at your head and get you in a fight. Why? Because wherever where there's strife, there's confusion in every evil work. I don't know how I got off quite so far off sub, subject tonight other than um, that, that key right there can block healing. There's a lot of things that can block healing, but what can, what can fix a marriage, the same thing that can fix healing or fix any other problem in your life, get verbal. Don't ever sit there because you're sick and be quiet. I guess I'm back on track. Say, take the picture on the inside of you and say it. Draw it out there. Put it out there. If you don't feel like it, that's when you need to be doing it. That's the most important time to be doing this. It's believing in your heart and saying with your mouth what obviously the devil doesn't want you to do or you, he wouldn't have you there sucking your thumb anyway. That's, how, that's when things started turning the corner for me on this little bout I had last week. In, uh, now there are some natural things that you can do when you're sick but I'm talking about the first thing the key to everything the key to life the center of your ministry the center of your walk with the Lord is right here in what you believe in your heart and say with your mouth on purpose, timely, and often. It's called prayer. It's one word for it. Could be called confession. It could be called walking with God. It could be called being a Christian, a Christian. Because the Christ in us that was in Jesus is activated by what we believe and say. And no other way. All that other stuff's religion. Looks like it's working sometimes because there are intercessors behind the scene that know what they're doing and they're praying the blessing into people's lives and the people think that they've found a way to end around this. I mean, that's too technical for me to have to believe and say, man, this is busy. I got this to do and this to do and this to do. You just keep living your defeated life, calling people to pray for you, 
when you get in a bind. And thank God it worked. Thank God for intercessory prayer. I'm, I want my, I want finding my way back into divine health. God showed me where I, why I needed divine healing. How the, that was my question. What happened to my divine health deal? <clears throat> and then you, you know, you ask God, He'll show you. And then He won't pass any blame off on it. It's just. If you don't like that, don't do that again. Do this. Don't do that, do this. That's where the curse is at, don't do that. Do this, that's where the blessing is at. Hallelujah, let's stand. Father, I thank you that these people tonight are blessed by the word they've heard. I thank you that your presence in this place did things in their bodies with the music and the sound waves that's affected them positively with the blessing. Father, I thank you that the curse can't stand and the enemy can't stand up to that blessing when it gets in the sound waves. Daniel played the harp and the devil is self-troubling soul, I believe. They can't stand your anointing in the music. They couldn't stand it tonight. And it drove things out of people because they were hearing your presence. And I thank you for that. And I thank you that uh, you, you, anything they need to know on how to keep that moving in their life, you'll reveal that to them this week. I thank you that uh, if they have questions, you'll, you'll, get them, you'll get them answered this week also. In Jesus' name, amen. amen.